Yeah, so first of all, thank you very much for the opportunity to be here. It's really nice to be, I mean, it's, it's a far away from home, but it's, it's been nice so far. Um, okay, so as these lectures are going to be about this thing called the KPZ fixed point, and I wanted to start just by saying a little bit, very briefly, what's the plan. So I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start describing what the KPZ fixed point is. And that's what I'm going to do today. I'm going to try to convince you why one may be interested in computing such a thing. I'm going to explain today what this is. Uh, and then I'm going to slowly start going to more detail and uh, some ideas of the proofs of how this thing is computed are going to come later in the, in the course. So in, in the, probably in the last three lectures. But today is, I, I plan it to be very introductory. And I'm just going to talk about in general what this is. I'm going to tell you what the KPZ fixed point is. Um, and then tomorrow we'll see more details about um, how it is characterized. Okay, so there's, I should say there's two sets of lecture notes that I'm gonna be referring to sometimes uh, for things that I'm not gonna do here. So two lecture notes. So the first one is on the, I think it's, it's linked on the website of the, of, of the conference, but it's also in my website. Okay, and that follows more or less closely what I'm gonna do here, not exactly, and there's some things there that I'm not gonna uh, do here. So some more details. And then there's another one uh, that's by my two co-authors, Konstantin Matetsky and Jeremy Quastel. It's called something like from, yeah, I think it's called from TASEP to the KPZ fixed point. And that's on the archive. I, I, I didn't write down the, the exact identifier, but you can find it on the archive. So both of them I'm gonna be, so they don't have exactly the same things. So many things are, are in both lecture notes, um, but uh, this one has some things that are not in my lecture notes, so it will be useful maybe if you want to take a, a look at particular parts. In particular, the part that, that explains something that Tomohiro was talking about uh, last week, uh, which is his Bethe-Ansatz solution to TASEP. Okay, so now I'm, I'm gonna very, so many of you know about what's the KPC universality class, and many of you maybe didn't know till last week, but maybe you were here, and Tomohiro Sasamoto talked a lot about this. So I'm gonna very briefly introduce one model uh, that it's one of the sort of basic models in KPZ, which is not the one we're gonna use. So I'm gonna, but just to introduce the ideas, let me tell you what's the Eden model. So this is a, this is a growth model in Okay, let me not say in two dimensions. It's, it's really happening in two dimensions, but we're interested in a one-dimensional interface. And it's really very simple. So you think about box, boxes in a lattice. So you're in Z2 here. And let's say we start with one box. And then what we do is that at each time step, we choose one boundary site of the cluster we have, and we add a box, another box. So maybe we add this one, and then maybe we add that one, maybe this one later, and we, we keep putting boxes on the boundary, uh, uniformly on the boundary. Okay, so you let this thing run for quite a while, and then after a long time, uh, maybe you start it here, and it's gonna look something like this. So you would expect to have some sort of macroscopic shape growing in time. Uh, of course, it's gonna be a little bit rough, and what you should expect is that this, this, this shape is growing linearly uh, with time, right? But really what we are gonna be interested in is in measuring the deviations from the mean. So here's the conjecture. The conjecture is that, I have, that if I measure how much the interface deviates from its mean, this should be something of the order of t to the one third. And then if I want to know at what, at, 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 at what scale do I see something interesting spatially, 
or if you want, at what space there's non-trivial, at, at what scale there's non-trivial correlations between different points, then this is going to happen at a scale of t to the two-thirds. Okay? So I'm going to explain much more clearly later what, what, what I mean by this t to the two-thirds in this special scale. Um, but what I want to point out here is that we have three exponents. And this is the famous, and I'm going to be saying this many times, the one, two, three scaling. Okay, so this, the way to think about this, so the one, two, three here is, I have a one, I have a two, and I have a three there, because it's three to the thirds. And the idea is that this three here corresponds to time, okay, because that's just the, it's the exponent uh, that's governing how time is growing, so this is essentially fixed. But then, if I'm fixing time, what I have is that fluctuations grow at a rate of t to the one-third, so that's the one, and this two is related to space. Okay? So that's the conjecture for this model. It's one of the oldest models that people were interested in. Um, and I'm going to write down what the conjecture will look like much more clearly uh, in a little bit. But let me just say, and this is just for comparison, that essentially uh, people simulated the Eden model. Mm -hmm. And they said it's definitely not KPC. And it's not the question of, of uh, uh, it's not the question of having too short simulation times. Of course, the computer were not so good, but they did the wrong analysis of their data. You see what they did? I mean, they let the object grow, and then you put sort of like uh, you know the average circle around this, and then relative to that average circle, they would measure the fluctuations. Yeah. And then you don't see the right fluctuations. In your case, I mean, you carefully put the dot in the middle. And this is where you put your, your first, uh, you know, growing object, and this defines the, the true center. And if you go from that center, you will see the KPC. Okay, yeah, that's true. Thanks. Okay, so that's, that's the Eden model. And as I was saying, um, essentially for this thing, nothing, nothing is known rigorously. Okay, so I won't really say anything about the Eden model. Uh, so essentially... Nothing proved. Okay, just, just for comparison, maybe to, to understand what's going on, one, one, could, one could do the Eden model, so this is just a convenient way of putting an initial condition. One can also run uh, the Eden model, say, on, a, on the line. So here you would probably start with boxes on the whole line, and then uh, you do the same thing. I'm not going to draw too much, but you keep going, and you have, say you start on a finite uh, box, or, or you take a limit somehow. And again, the conjecture is the same. The conjecture is that you're going to have this interface growing linearly in time. The fluctuations, so the size of the fluctuations, the, the, the difference between the, the place where the interface is and, and its mean should be like of, t to one, of order t to one third and with this uh, spatial scaling. Now, compare with, just for comparison to have an idea of what we're talking about, Compare with what's called random deposition. And this is a really simple model. Okay, so here, the norm, again, we are on the lattice. And now I have, say, boxes raining down at rate one at each side, independently. Okay? independently across sites. So I'm going to have these things growing. And then if, if you look at it from, from far away, it's going to look something like this, right? So you're going to have some very long columns, some short columns, and so on. Okay, and here it's very easy to say exactly what's going on. At each site, essentially I have a Poisson process. Right, so again I have Interface grows um, like T. But now the fluctuations, 
mean, you, we can all say what the fluctuations are. This is just a Poisson process, so it's a Poisson random variable. So what you'll see is that the fluctuations at each site are of order t to the one half, and they're going to be Gaussian. So fluctuations are t to the one half Gaussian, and so it's it's different exponents. And in this very simple model, um, there's no space correlations, right? Everything is independent. Okay, so again, we're not going to use this, but I just, it's a good way to, I, I think, to try to keep in mind what we're doing. So we're trying to understand these fluctuations, but in a, in a growth model, which is a lot more rigid. Okay, and, and what's going to end up happening is that you have this spatial structure at this scale, and the, the fluctuations are of our smaller order, e to the one third. Okay, so the idea of this KPZ universality class, in, in a way this, this, this corresponds to what one may call the Gaussian universality class. So there's many models which would look like this. Um, but this is a model that belongs to the so-called KPZ universality class, and the idea is that there's going to be a huge number of models which should satisfy the same things as this one. So, number one, you should have these scalings, and number two, the distribution of the fluctuations should be the same, and I'm going to get into that uh, in a moment. So, as I was saying, we know nothing about the Eden model, except that we would like to prove um, the same things as I'm going to show you uh, in an hour model, which is TASEP. So what we're going to do is work with something called the totally asymmetric simple exclusion process. Or for short, ASAP. And this is going to be another growth model, or alternatively, a particle system. But this one is going to be much simpler to study, and we're going to be able to say things. So, so instead of studying this one, we're going to study another model, which is conjectured to be, which is in the KBC universality class. And this is one for which we're going to prove things. OK, so the totally symmetric exclusion process, let me first describe it as a particle system. So it's a particle system taking place on the lattice. And at every site, you can have a particle or no particle. That's the only possibility. So I put particles, then I put a hole, maybe some other particle, hole, hole, particle, 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 hole, and so on. So every site is either occupied by a particle or not. And then the dynamics is very simple. Every, every particle tries to jump to the right at rate one, but there's an exclusion rule which tells you that if a particle wants to jump to an occupied site, then that's not allowed. That's, that's the whole process. Okay, particles try to jump to the right. If the neighbor is empty, then the jump is permitted, otherwise it's, it's uh, forbidden and nothing happens. So this is this is the particle system. Here I was talking about growth models. So it turns out that there's a growth model associated to this particle system, and it's, it's very simple to, to describe. Um, so what you do is <clears throat> you write, I'm going to write something which looks like an interface, something like this. And it's something I'm going to call the height function of TASEP. And the way to do it is that above every occupied site, I'm going to this was also mentioned uh, last week. Um, so above every side, I'm going to put a piece of a segment, a segment of a line of slope one. And above every hole, I put a piece of a segment, a segment of a line uh, of slope minus one. OK, so then I keep going. So this one goes up and down, up down, down, up, 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 down, and up. 
keeps going. Okay, so you, you can. I mean, it's it's easy to see that modulo uh, a height shift. So I, I could have started this at any point, right? I just started it here for the drawing. But modulo that height shift, there's a there's a bijection between these sort of configurations and those, right? You just can read off one from the other. It's very simple. And and the way one usually does this is that you fix the height at at some position in the origin, say you fix it to be zero, and then you have a unique way of of, uh, of connecting one to the other. Now, what, what's, the, what's the dynamics of the height function when, how does the particle dynamics translate into the dynamics of the height function? Well, again, it's very simple. You can check that when this particle jumps to the right, then this segment is now gonna go, I'll use another color, is now gonna go down, and this one is gonna go up. So really, you can just, if you want, you can completely forget about the particles, and you can think of the height function as being a Markov process where every local, every local max turns into a, sorry, every local min turns into a local max. Maybe it's easier to draw it this way. Every time you have something like this, it's gonna turn into something like that at rate one uh, independently. Okay? And then we're gonna have this interface growing in time. It's actually, it's, it's just a convenient choice for us. It's, it's growing down. This has usually been done with the interface group moving up, but of course it's the same. I'm gonna have this interface evolving down, and uh, I'm gonna call this h t comma x, so h of t comma x is the position of the height function at time t and position x. So these have been subject of, of intense study, uh, both in the statistical physics community and in the probability communities. And there's lots of work that has been done in, in many directions. I'm, I'm gonna tell you about the earlier work uh, that's relevant for us. So, at this point, what, what I'm interested in is this sort of conjecture. Okay, so I'm gonna tell you what, what was known since essentially last decade. Um, so, let me put it like this. So, TASIP with some special initial conditions, which are gonna play an important role, was solved, let's say, in the last decade. So the first one, the first special initial condition is what's called the step initial condition, or could be called maybe the narrow wedge initial condition. And it's, it's the following initial condition. So at the level of particles, what I do is, if the origin is here, I put this packed initial condition to the left. So I put all sides are occupied by particles to the left of the origin, and no, no particles to the right. Okay? So this is, if, if you look at, I mean, it's called step initial condition because of this uh, structure. Now, if you look at what the, what the height function looks like, it's very simple, it just looks like this. Right? And then I'm gonna have this thing evolving down, and what I'll see, this is, this is what's known, I will see something which looks essentially looks like a parabola, and on top of this parabola, there's some fluctuations. So the parabola is sort of the mean where I would expect this, this interface to be after a long time, and the real, the real interface is this red interface, which is sort of going around this parabola, okay? And if you want, you can go to Patrick's website, and there's some nice simulations 
of this, you can see them evolving in time. And you'll see a picture like this, it's a flipped. Okay, so this is, this is how the thing looks like if you look at a simulation, but actually uh, this has been completely characterized, okay? So this is, this is a result of Ahofer and Herbert, and then Johansson did some sort of strengthening of, of the result that I'm going to uh, write. And what it says is the following. So it says that if I, and, and now, now I hope it's, this is going to, this scaling it should become clear now. Okay, so what I do is I look at the height function for taste at time t, and I look at this scale in space, t to the two thirds. So I'm doing this rescaling. Then I'm going to subtract some constant. I'm not going to worry about constants now but some constant times t, because this is really going linearly down in time, there's this parabola which is also gonna show up, that the thing's going down, so I have to subtract that. I should actually, I should add that. Depends on the value of the constant, but this is going down, so I'm adding some positive constant, okay? And then I'm going to divide by some other constant times t to the one third. So again, Here's the one, sorry, the one, two, three scaling. One for the size of the fluctuations. So I have to divide by t to the two thirds to see something. Two for the spacious, spatial scale at which I have to look. And the three is just coming from, from the time, okay? And what was proved is that this thing converges in some sense, uh, but a strong sense, say finite dimensional distributions, but more is known, uh, as t goes to infinity, to something called the Airy 2 process, which is this one, minus a parabola. So it's, it's completely understood. I can take this limit and I can tell you exactly what it is. So it's gonna be a parabola, which is this one, and then the fluctuations around this parabola are given by this Airy 2 process. Okay, I have to tell you what's the Airy 2 process. Uh, it was also discussed last week, but it, I'm, I'm gonna say it again. Other questions? Okay. So, I will say a little bit more about the Airy 2 process in a moment. For now, let me just say that, so the Airy 2, this is the Airy 2 process. Um, the Airy 2 process, okay, it's, it's not a Markov process, but it's, it's just a process, I mean, it's, it's, it's a curve in, from R to R. It's stationary, okay, so the marginals are all the same, meaning that once you take, a, take once you subtract this parabola, what you see is something that looks the same everywhere. And, um, the marginals are Tracy Whedon GUE random variables. So what that means is that if I look at the deviation, at, at this deviation here, at, I fix one point, and I look at that fluctuation, then the fluctuation is of order t to the one third, but the distribution coincides with the asymptotic fluctuations of the largest eigenvalue of a GUE matrix. Okay? I think most of you know what this is because, I mean, this has been, you probably know it or, or this has been discussed in, in previous weeks. Okay? Maybe I'll say it very, very briefly. So you take, you take a square matrix of size n and you put complex Gaussians in the, as the entries, but you condition it to be Remission. So you just put complex Gaussians on the, above the diagonal and then you uh, take the, the Hermitian adjoint. And you look at that matrix, you look at the eigenvalues of that matrix and you look at the largest eigenvalue of that matrix. And if you scale correctly, uh, the fluctuations of that eigenvalue converge to a random variable which is uh, called the Tracy-Widom 2 distribution or the Tracy-Widom GUE distribution. 
Okay, that's, that's the first of my special initial conditions. The second of the special initial conditions is what's called flat or periodic. So in this periodic initial condition, what one does is I put one particle, one hole, one particle, one hole, like this. So particle, hole, particle, hole, like this. And then the height function, the initial condition for the height function looks like this. It's like a SOTU. I'm not sure I got right the, I probably shifted a little bit the SOTU, but I guess you can imagine what I was trying to draw. And then, again, this is gonna move down at a speed proportional to t, and what you're gonna see so macroscopically, this thing is flat, because you started flat, and the, the, the dynamics is translation invariant, so you should expect to see something flat in the limit, and on top of this flat, uh, on top of this mean, if you want, again, there's gonna be some fluctuations, which are also completely uh, understood. So um, this is work, well, there's two papers, but it's by Alexei Borodin, Rahofer again, Patrick, and Mojito. And what it tells you is something very similar. It tells you that if I scale this, um, I actually, yeah, I think I'm, I'm, I'm missing a constant here. So there should be a should be another constant there to really get the area two process. But it's not really very important. I should put the constant here as well. Now this thing goes to something called the area one process. And I don't have to add anything because this is flat. Okay, so I have already subtracted the linear growth, and what I'm left with is this area one process. So this area, the area one process, again, it's, it's stationary, and it has, the marginals now are Tracy Widom G O E, or Tracy Widom one, okay? Can you see here? Okay. So the Tracy, again, this is the asymptotic fluctuations of the largest eigenvalue of another family of matrices, and now it's the same thing as I described before, except that these are real Gaussians and the matrix is symmetric. Okay? And this is what you get. Um, at some point I may try to at least give an idea why you get this Tracy Widom GUE here, where the, where the, where the random matrix uh, fluctuations come from. Uh, this one way to understand it, this is a little bit more mysterious. It's, it's, I mean, it's not entirely clear where, where this GOE distribution comes from. Um, but here, there's a way to see it. For this one, yes. I, I mean, to a large extent, yes. For this one, no. For this one, you can see why it's, why, I mean, after the fact, well, not after the fact, really. There's a way to understand what's going on. And, and I'm gonna, I, I mean, I should have time and I'm gonna say that, but probably in the third lecture or something. Okay, any other questions? Is there anything, I mean, the, so I, there's part of the story I have not been telling which has to do with renormalization type arguments, which is where this thing got started, and I'm gonna mention it very briefly later, which is the KPZ equation. The KPZ equation is one of the models in the class um, it's a special one in a sense, but I'm not really gonna talk about it. Uh, and there, the, the, the first predictions of these scalings, the ones that I just erased, uh, came out from, 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 I mean, from physics arguments using um, sort of renormalization type arguments. Um, but I don't know if the, if, if, if the, somehow the dependence on the initial condition shows up there. I don't think there's really any RG, as you know, we know from critical phenomena. I mean, 
I think the way one should look at this thing is that, uh, you know, it, it's sort of somewhat hidden, and then Daniel will tell more about it. You know, there is some integrable model. I mean, it's stochastic, but it's integrable. And, you know, this kind of, of course, you know, the, if I do the discrete model, I mean, then, you know, it doesn't have the scaling yet. I mean, so, you know, we do the scaling on the discrete model for very one, very special, special initial condition and for a particular observable, and then we sort of see the scaling behavior. So that sort of hints that, you know, somewhere in the back there must be some more complicated, but then nevertheless integrable model. That, that, that's sort of the picture which one should have. Yeah, and, that, and, and that's exactly what, what this KPZ fixed point process is going to describe. That's the point. Now, in terms of how do you see that from, like, more this other type of arguments? I, yeah, I know. Um, okay, I will just... So, maybe I should mention that, um, so, so this is, this is from 05, 07, something like that. And there's a, there's a similar, a similar type of result, which I'm not going to uh, write down, so there's a similar result for When, when the initial condition is a simple random walk path. So this is called the stationary case. This is due to, um, ah, I'm saying Patrick, but writing Ferrari, it's, it's Patrick and Herbert from maybe 2010. Well, you correct me if, if it's, that's right, bike. Now, what happens in this case is that you still have something, it's something called the airy stat process, so it's the stationary airy process. The reason I wanted to mention this, well, one is because this is one of the, exact, the exactly solvable cases uh, that people have been looking for a long time. And if you think about what's a simple random walk path, then what, what you should put here is just a product measure. Okay, so you put product measure here. So you just choose independently on each side to put a particle or not. And this is called stationary because it's, it's pretty easy to check that this initial condition is stationary for TASEP. So if you start with a product measure and run the TASEP dynamics on the particles, then you get a, the same product measure after any time. So this is the stationary case. And what you get here is something called the Aristat process. And the, again, it's, it's a stationary process. It's actually a Brownian motion. But it's a Brownian motion which doesn't start at zero. It starts with a very non-trivial uh, distribution at the center. And that's called um, the bike range distribution. And it's not clear. I mean, nobody has found any connection to random matrices, and I don't think there is one. So um, it's still explicit, but it doesn't come from random matrices. Okay, so, so essentially those were the three initial conditions that had been uh, studied. The, the other type of initial condition that uh, can be handled in the same ways correspond to putting half of one initial condition on one side of the origin and half of the other initial condition on the other side of the origin. So for example, I could start, I'm gonna erase this, but I could start with say, periodic, and then nothing here. And then after some time, I'm going to see something which looks like this. And then the fluctuations on top are going to be something that's called the ARI221 process. And it's going to look like the ARI2 process over here. Sorry. It's going to look like the ARI1 process over there. I did it very wrong. It's exactly the other way around. So it should be flat here and then like a parabola. So over here, I'm going to see something that's converging to the ARI1 process. Over there, I'm going to see something that's converging to the ARI2 process. And you can do... So this is one of the possibilities, and you can do two more, of course, with the other uh, pairings. Okay, so I'm going to make an aside now um, about this general description, and I'm going to tell you a little bit more what's this ARI2 process, at least how it is defined, okay? Because these sort of formulas are going to play an important role uh, in, in the next lectures. So the ARI2 process. As I said, it's a stationary process, and the 
Mart the, the finite dimensional distributions are given by Fresnel determinants. First, I'll write, I won't, during the whole course, I will try to, I, I, I will cheat a little bit, just to keep things simple. So everything I'm going to say will be about computing finite dimensional distributions for any number of points, but most of the computations I'll do are going to be for one point, just because it's much simpler to write down, okay? So first I'm going to tell you what's the one point distribution of the ARE2 process. A. So the probability that area 2 is less than A, well, I, I already told you that this is a Tracy Whedon GUE distribution. So if you know how to write that down, um, you would be able to. This is the Fretham determinant. I'm going to say in a moment what that is. Of I minus something called the Airy, the Airy kernel. And so the Fretham determinant is an extension of the finite, the normal determinant to infinite dimensions, in particular to Hilbert spaces. So I have to say where this is being computed. And this is being computed in the Hilbert space of L2 functions supported on the semi-infinite interval A to infinity. And who's this Airy kernel? Actually, I'll leave some space here. So this airy, this airy kernel is the same airy kernel from random matrices. It's the, the one that's the correlation kernel of the point process given by, these, uh, by the asymptotic eigenvalues. Um, but it's, it's written as follows. Um, at x, y, this is the integral from 0 to infinity of airy x plus lambda Airy y plus lambda. Okay, and, and this Airy, if you haven't seen it before, this is something called the Airy function. Okay, so the Airy function is one particular special function. I'm going to give a definition later on, um, but it's, it's just a fixed function. So how you should think about this is as follows. You, you can, okay, this is, there's a theory about freedom determinants, and this is the freedom determinant of a certain operator in L2. It's exactly the right uh, generalization of the finite determinant. So it satisfies everything that you may want it to satisfy. So for instance, if this is a finite rank operator, then it's essentially a finite dimensional determinant and you get the same answer as you should. The other thing that it satisfies, at least when k is, I mean, you have to have some conditions on this so that this is finite, but when k is good, um, this determinant is actually the product of one minus the eigenvalues of k. So k has to be m compact, more than compact, really, but it's, it's going to have a discrete spectrum. So the determinant is the product of uh, the eigenvalues, 1 minus the eigenvalues, as it should. But we actually don't really need much uh, of that. We won't really use much of the determinant in the lectures. It's, it's used heavily in, in the proof. But there's actually a formula, which if you haven't seen it, it looks a little bit mysterious. But if you want, you can forget about Hilbert spaces and you can forget about L2 and anything, and you just think of K as a matrix. It's a matrix, but the indices of the matrix are all the real numbers larger than A, okay? And the way to compute it is the following. You have to compute this big integral, so in, inside so you have this sum over n, and then you're computing a, an n-fold integral, and inside you have to put the determinant of this matrix. So now you choose n points, and you evaluate this, this function of two variables at all the possible pairs. You compute the determinant, then you integrate, and then you sum. And that gives you the answer. And as long as k is good enough, uh, this is going to be convergent, and, and you get the answer. Okay? Maybe a good exercise for anybody who's interested is to see that this actually, there's a formula which is very similar in the, for, for matrices. So if you compute the determinant of i minus a matrix, 
you can expand it exactly like this, summing over the determinant of the minors of the matrix. So this is just the, 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 the natural extension of that. Okay, so actually this is, as I said, I'm gonna write it once more, but from random, maybe this is not the best color. Uh, this is the Tracy Widom GUE distribution. It's exactly how it shows up in random matrix theory. This is what Tracy and Widom compute. Okay, now, so this, is, this is the one point distribution. What about the multi point distribution? Because remember, I'm interested in this, in this sort of thing where I am looking at this process as a function of t. So for now, t has been fixed, but as a function of x. So I want to see how this interface evolves, but the whole interface, not at just one point. So as I said, uh, the finite dimensional distributions are again given by a Fredholm determinant. So the finite dimensional distributions are given in terms of an, something that I'm going to call an extended kernel formula. Yeah, I'm going to write what finite dimensional means, but, but it, it just means I want to ask what's the probability that area two at point x1 is less than a1, and area two at some other point xn is less than an an. Okay, so that's the finite dimensional distributions of the process. If I give you the finite dimensional distributions of the process, and they are consistent, they are of course, uh, then I have characterized the distribution of the process. And this is written as follows. So again, I am not get, gonna get into too many details because I don't wanna deal with extended kernels. So let me write it like this. So this is gonna be the freedom determinant of the extended area kernel. I have to tell you what's the, what's the L2 space, what's the Hilbert space where I'm computing this. So this is gonna be an extended Hilbert space and in this notation, I can write it as follows. So, so instead of computing the determinant on L2, I'm computing the determinant on a direct sum of many copies of L2, like this. So it's, it's L2 of A1 infinity up to L2 of An infinity. So you should, what you should think the way to think about this is that K, the extended kernel, is just a matrix where each entry is an operator. It's an oper operator valued matrix, okay? So now instead of having just a single function, you have a matrix of functions and then you put those in and you're gonna have a, big, a bigger determinant. You compute the determinant of that and you keep going, okay? And I'm gonna tell you what, what, this, what this extended area kernel is. So, if I want to know, so as I said, this is now a matrix of operators. So if I want to tell you its value, I have to tell you what's the ij entry. So the ij entry is one of these kernels. So now I evaluate at x comma y. Okay. And again, this is not going to play a very important role for us but there's something I need to explain. Okay, and this is the formula. So the ij entry looks as follows. So it has two pieces. First, it's e to the minus xj minus xi Laplacian, so sorry, not minus, plus. So this is just the heat kernel, the usual heat kernel evaluated at x comma y, so this is just the transition probabilities of Brownian motion. But this term only comes in when xi is less than xj. Otherwise, this backwards heat kernel, I mean, if, if, if this is negative, then it means that I should be inverting the heat kernel and that really makes no sense, okay? Um, so due to this, 
this is okay. And then plus something else, and here, oops, okay, I, I made a little mistake. Let me, but I can fix it very easily. Because of the way I'm writing things, I should not be writing a one here, I should be putting in the parabola. Okay, so I'm, instead of writing the finite dimensional distributions instead of a one, I just add the parabola, but it's the same thing. Okay, and now this is correct. So now I do the following thing. I put e to the minus xi Laplacian, k airy, e to the xj Laplacian, x comma y. Now here it really should look like I'm cheating because I just told you that I had to put xi minus less than xj so that this is positive so that the heat kernel makes sense. And here I don't even know the sign of this, uh, but it's, I mean, half of the time it's gonna be positive and half of the time it's really gonna be negative because at some point I'm gonna have e to the minus xi and then in some other entry I'm gonna have e to the plus xi. But this is okay. And I'm gonna tell you tomorrow why this is okay. Okay, so for now I'm gonna leave it there. It's okay. The only thing that I wanna convince you is that if I know in, in, in at least for the early two process, if I know the one point kernel, then the extended kernel can be computed out of that. Because I have this airy kernel, which I know, it appears here, and now I just compute it against known things. There's this little detail, but it doesn't matter for now. So I have these known things and I produce this big matrix, and out of this big matrix I, I I produce the, the finite dimensional distributions, okay? So what I, what I wanted to say is that all extended kernels, extended kernels have this structure. So later when I, when I describe other, other processes, uh, I won't really talk about the extended version because you can always build it in a way which is analogous to this, okay? It doesn't mean that that's all you have to compute. Really, I'm gonna talk about that later, but at least it's gonna make the presentation a bit clearer if I stick to the one point distribution. That's, that's the idea. Okay, so that's, that's the ARI2 process. The ARI1 process is similar with k area of x, y replaced by another kernel, and the kernel is, in a way it's simpler, area of x plus y. So you do the same thing, but you put this kernel, or maybe a scaled version of this. I think one has to scale this, has to put some twos outside and some twos inside but it's essentially this, and you do all this thing, and what pops out is the area one kernel. Oh, it's the Laplacian, so it's second derivative operator. So, so this, is, this is just no, that's a good point to make on the board. So this is simply, this is the heat kernel. And, and the point is that I mean, this backwards heat kernel is not well defined. The heat kernel is not invertible, but actually it is well defined when acting against this function, with this operator. Um, they are they are fixed. So this, they are this. And and I made I, actually I made a bad choice. So this should I should have written u and v here. So this x has nothing to do with the other x's. Okay. Um, I'll change it, it doesn't take too long. So th these are just the times or the spatial positions where you're looking at your, at your uh, kernel. I, I'm sorry, at the process. Okay, I need to hurry up a little bit to, to get to the main theorem. But let me f first, before doing that, Actually, so let, let, me, let me just go to that. So 
here's, a, here's what's known as the strong KPZ universality conjecture. And it says the following. It says that for all models in the class, so every model that belongs to the KPZ class should satisfy the following. So every model should have something which looks like a height function. like the one we constructed for Tracep. And what one should have is the following. Let's say the, the height function HT of X satisfies the following. So if I take H, there's always going to be constants. So I put some constant C1, epsilon to the minus 3 halves T, then I put some arc constant C2, epsilon to the minus 1x. So I'm, I'm rescaling in the way with, with, with this usual, for now I wrote the 2 and 3 part of the 1, 2, 3 scaling. Then I have to add something that's going to depend on epsilon times t. And sorry, here I don't divide. It's easier to. If I do this, And I multiply by epsilon to the one half. Again, one, two, and three. One is the size of the fluctuations, two is the spatial scale, and three is time. So what this should do is that as, as epsilon goes to zero, this should go to a single process of t and x. And what's this process? This, con this is a conjecture. So the conjectural process, well, it's not conjectural because that's the, that's the, so the, the conjecture is that everything, satis everything goes to uh, a single thing, but I'm going to tell you what this is. Uh, but the conjectural process is called the KPZ fixed point. And I'll tell you now why it's called the KPZ fixed point. Oh, I, 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 I forgot to say something. The, I, I can't expect this to happen anytime. I need to have convergence of the initial distribution, of the initial condition, right? So whenever. Um, epsilon to the one half h zero c two epsilon to the minus one x conver converges in some sense. So if the initial condition with the same scaling converges, then at any time t, I should have convergence to some object which is this h t of x. And notice that this is just diffusive scaling. When I take out time, this is just one, two. Uh, so it's, it's, it's just like the convergence of a simple, it's what we were seeing there. It's, if, if I take the simple random walk, then the limit would be, uh, the limiting initial condition would be a Brownian motion. And, okay, this conjectural process is called the KPZ fixed point, and it satisfies, uh, or it should satisfy a number of things. Um, so one thing is that the one, two, three scaling is universal. So this is what's universal in the class. So every object in the class should be rescaled with this scaling. Uh, the constants are not. So of course, uh, what constants I have to put here to get the same object will depend. If I put different constants, constants I'm going to get rescaled versions of that, but it's essentially the same thing. So that's one thing. Um, so H T X, so the point of this being a universality class is that this should be the same for every model, but it will depend on the initial condition. We already saw that, right? So H T X depends only on the initial condition. And 
the initial condition is H0 of X, well, is the limit of this thing. So, so give it a name, H0. Of course, this all has to be in some space, but for now this is conjectural, and it's the only thing that it should depend on. So in particular for TASEP, if you want, any time that you have an initial condition, it may not be this. Of course, this initial condition converges to the zero initial condition in the limit if you rescale diffusively, but it's not the only one that converges to the zero initial condition. You could take, for instance, maybe two steps up, two steps down, two steps up, two steps, or, or something, some perturbation. It could even be some small random perturbation of that, and it may still converge to a flat initial condition, and any time you have that, the limit should be the ARE1 process. So that's the conjecture. And what else? This is something important, is that HTX is invariant in distribution under the one, two, three scaling. Hence the name. So let me first explain what I mean by that. What I mean is that if I take H and I scale it like this, so I put an alpha here, alpha to the minus one, sorry, alpha to the minus three T, and alpha to the minus two X. And I'm gonna use this notation to tell you what's the initial condition because I also have to rescale the initial condition. This is, this is the initial condition. But the point is, if you give me some initial condition and you rescale in, with descaling one, two, three, what this process looks like at a later time, then this is equal in distribution to HTX started with H0. So it's, it's invariant under that scaling. Just as Brownian motion is invariant in distribution under diffusive scaling, uh, here I have to I have three, three exponents. And I also have to, if, if I only put H0 here, then I get this with a scaled initial condition. I could have done it that way. Um, so, okay, this is, this is one of the main uh, maybe properties of, the, of this fixed point. It's what gives it its name. But it's completely, if, if one manages to prove this, so if one manages to prove um, that this thing arises as the limit of some object in this way, then that is completely free, right? Because I just, I mean, it's, it's, you just multiply epsilon by some alpha and you get it completely for free. So, so this is built into, built into the definition, okay? So this is, this is direct. Okay, let, can I take two minutes to, so let me tell you what's the, very briefly, I'm gonna get started with this tomorrow. So this is with Konstantin Matetsky and Jeremy Costel. And almost everything that I'm gonna be talking about today, I'm sorry, during the whole lecture, sorry, it's, it's from this joint work, some things will not be. Uh, it says the following, it says, okay, let H, T, X, B, the TASEP height function. Assume that epsilon to the one half H zero, and then the, the constant now is fixed, it's two, converges to some H zero in a space UC, I'm gonna tell you tomorrow about what's this space UC, but this is a space of upper semi-continuous functions and the topology is the local house of topology. So H0 is a upper semi-continuous function and I assume that the initial condition converges in that sense. Then, epsilon to the one half, well, same thing, but I have to write it again. Um, 
can remember if there is a two or there is no two, just, just to write it correctly. Um, yeah, there's a two. So two epsilon to the minus three halves t, two epsilon to the minus one x, plus um, epsilon to the minus three halves t, this thing converges to some object, which is this KPZ fixed point, as a process in T and X in UC. So the convergence, again, is as a process. And uh, it's as a process taking values in this space of upper semi-continuous functions. And, and I'm going to finish with this, where H T X is a Markov process <clears throat> taking values in U C with. sort of explicit transition probabilities. N not quite, but almost. Okay? I'm going gonna, I'm, I'm gonna to show what these transition probabilities are tomorrow. But the thing to take out of this theorem is that in this strong KPC universality conjecture, there's supposed to be a single process which arises as the limit of everything. But even the process was conjectural. And now what this theorem says is that at least if you start with TASEP exactly in the right framework, so you should have convergence of the initial conditions, then the one, two, three rescaled height function converges to something, and I can tell you exactly what it is. I can give you the transition probabilities. And moreover, and this is interesting, the process itself is a Markov process. So the, the, the process of the, it's, it's a Markov process at the level of this interface. So if I know the interface at time t, then that's all I need to know about, uh, to know about the distribution at some, at some later time. Um, okay, so I'm going to stop here, and tomorrow I keep going, and I tell you what, what's missing from this theorem.